According to Beverly driver Eddie, little has been written about the history of Camp Ritchie, Maryland. Dickinson College retired professor Eddie says in her book, Ritchie Boy Secrets, that on June 19, 1942, the U.S. Army opened a secret military intelligence training center. Over the next four years, it produced some 20,000 graduates, intelligence and language specialists, for service in World War II. Some of the famous names of men who were Ritchie Boys include J.D. Salinger, former Senators John Chafee and Frank Church, David Rockefeller, and the Reverend William Sloan Coffin. Professor Bev Eddy, when did you first get interested in knowing German? Oh, that's a that's a good one. I was sort of a trying to rebel when I went off to college, and my father warned me. He was a biologist. He said, um, "Whatever you do, don't study German because that almost kept me from getting my doctorate." And um, so I sort of was intrigued at the idea, and I went off to college and signed up for German. How many? I liked it. <laughs> do, do you have a German connection? Uh, I, I do, actually, on my mother's side. I never knew too much about it, but my grandfather um, had come over as a young boy uh, from Bohemia, and he and his little sister and his parents. And soon after they landed in the States, the parents died. And um, the uh, the children then were adopted. And so my grandfather never learned German. And he was, um, that was his whole identity, was that he was a German. And so when I was little, he, he uh, memorized reams of German poetry in the English translation. And uh, he used to uh, tell me these poems in, in English. Um, and I didn't even realize at the time that they were German <laughs> until later. I'm going to get to the Richie Boys book in a moment, but I still want to ask you some questions about your own background. Where's Where's Bohemia? Oh, it's it's Czechoslovakia, part of Czechoslovakia now. And when you studied German, where did you go to do that? I uh, went to the College of Worcester. In Ohio? And then, and then at Worcester, Ohio, that's right. And then um, they started a new summer program in Vienna while I was a student there. And so I went on that program to Vienna, and I really lucked out at being housed with a German woman over there who was very cultured and who promoted my learning by telling me to go to see these museum exhibits or go to these plays and then discuss them with her when I got home in German. And uh, it was really by the end of that summer that I decided I want to go on with this. When did you first start teaching German at Dickinson College? Uh, let's see. It would have been in the fall of 73. I taught before that at Middlebury College. And then um, I got married to someone who was tenured <laughs> in Pennsylvania, and I was not yet tenured. And so I came down to Pennsylvania and applied for a job at Dickinson and got it. The reason I'm asking you this is I want to ask you next, what has happened to the interest on the part of students from that first year of 73 throughout your career uh, until you retired about studying German? Well, it's it's kind of hard to say. Uh, the, the circumstances have changed for students who want to learn German. Uh, when I went over to Germany, I didn't... Um, I was very fearful about doing it, and my I, again, I remember my father saying to me that um, everything is going to be different over there. The language is going to be different, the clothes, what they eat, everything is going to be different, but English sparrows are there. You'll always <laughs> be able to find English sparrows. He was English. <laughs> and so... Uh, that was a situation that you you went over there and no one knew German. You had to explain. Uh, no one knew English, and so you had to explain everything that you wanted in some convoluted way if you didn't know the language. Nowadays, when students go over there, 
everything is just like in America. The food, the clothes, the language, and you almost have to insist on speaking German uh, if you want to learn it there. Um, the, most people will want to speak English to you. And so it's, it's become much more difficult, I think, for students. What's the hardest part of learning German? Oh, my. I really can't think. I mean, how does it, I, maybe this one, how does the language differ if you're studying German versus English? Well, um, one thing about studying German, I guess, is that everything is pronounced exactly the way it's spelt. And this makes it different from something like French, where um, it's not that way. There's a lot of silent letters in it. So German is, is very logical. It's uh, structural. Um, it, I think it makes you think a little more carefully, because just because of the way it's structured, so often the verb doesn't come until the end of the sentence. And if you're speaking English, say, uh, you, can, you can develop your thought as you talk, and you can shift even uh, things as you're going through the sentence. And you can't do that that well in, in, in German. And I, I think that's one reason why German, for instance, is a language for philosophers. Which leads me to the question about Richie Boys. How many... Yeah. How many German-speaking, well, obviously Germans, were involved in the Ritchie Boys, and what, who were they? Okay, uh, of the Ritchie Boys, uh, roughly 20% were immigrants from Germany and Austria. And uh, they, some of them had even been um, held in concentration camps before they came over here, um, after Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when they had the uh, anti-Semitic pogroms in, in Germany, um, men, 18, Jew, Jewish men 18 years and older, were put into concentration camps with the idea of scaring them into emigrating. They, they hadn't come up with a final solution yet. They just wanted to get them out of the country. And um, so quite a few of them had even been in the very camps that they liberated then later on in the war. Um, these immigrants, understandably, were very anxious to do their bit to go back to defeat Hitler. After all, they'd left, lots of them had left their parents, their, their, their families, their brothers and sisters behind in Germany. Um, in many cases, they didn't know what had happened to them because once war broke out, there was no correspondence anymore between Germany and the United States. Um, and so it was a, it was a very emotional and, and, and tough situation for them. When did you first become aware of the Ritchie boys? Uh, I became aware of them because I was writing a book on Thomas Mann's two oldest children, and his oldest son had gone to Camp Ritchie. And so I got interested in that originally through him. And then um, one of the Ritchie boys, um, Guy Stern, uh, came to the area, came to Fort Ritchie. And so I was talking to him if he knew anything about, uh, about Klaus Mann being at uh, Camp Ritchie. And he told me about that the, the, there was a sub-camp of Ritchie in Gettysburg called Camp Sharp and that maybe Klaus Mann had been there. Well, I knew that wasn't true, but then what Guy said next really uh, got me per perking up when he said, you know, the story about Camp Sharp has never been told, and it, it, these men are dying off, and this would be a good time to find out about them. And so I set my work on the Manns aside for two years and interviewed intensely uh, ten of the men that had gone through that camp, which was for psychological warfare. It concentrated just on con uh, psychological warfare. And I wrote, wrote a book about that. And then I thought I was done. And um, uh, f someone who's become a good friend, Dan Gross, who's done lots and lots of research into the Ritchie boys, called me one day and said, I want you to write this book. 
And uh, I kind of protested because at my age, I (laughs) wasn't sure that I could finish it. (laughs) And uh, I said, I I can't take on anything that's going to take me more than two years. (laughs) And he said, well, I'll give you all my notes. I have all this information here. And I go into the National Archives every single day. So if you have any questions, you can just call on me. Well, that was something I could not say no to, and uh, I got so involved that um, <clears throat> now, night and day, I'm I'm thinking about the Ritchie boys, I'm corresponding with relatives of Ritchie boys, and um, writing up little individual pieces on individual Ritchie boys, so I've I've really gotten hooked on it. Let's talk about location. Where is Dickinson College located, and how big is it? Uh, Dickinson College is in South Central Pennsylvania in Carlisle, the town of Carlisle, and I lived <clears throat> I lived south of Carlisle, sort of between Carlisle and Gettysburg, and so <clears throat> I live very much in the area between um, Camp Ritchie and, and Camp Sharp. I'm in Washington. If I got in my car and <clears throat> drove to Camp Ritchie, how long would it take me to get there? I've never driven there from Washington, so I can't say. But if you know where Hagerstown, Pennsylvania is, oh, yeah. it's near yeah. Hagerstown. That's the biggest town near there. Right on the border uh, between Maryland and Pennsylvania? It's right on the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania, yes. I saw a list of everybody, not everybody, because how many Ritchie boys were there? Well, um, the numbers, it depends on what you look at. There were 15,253 who enrolled in the classes there and 11,637 who graduated. So um, <clears throat> I, I count as Ritchie boys anyone who enrolled. Um, some people count the number that graduated. You have some of this in your book. I saw another list. I just named them that these were all supposed to be Richie boys in the past. John Kluge, who used to own Metro Media Television, was at one point the richest man in the United States. William Sloan, yes. William Sloan Coffin, the minister. Yeah. J.D. Yeah. Salinger, the writer. Mm-hmm. David Rockefeller. Senators John Chafee, Senator Frank Church. Vernon Walters, former CIA and U.N., and... All that, and how did all these now famous people become Ritchie boys? Um, They were selected by the War Department, and it was based primarily on their language and cultural knowledge, Um, because at Ritchie, it started out primarily uh, training interrogators of prisoners of war. And so they wanted people who not only knew all the nuances of the language to be able to interrogate these people, but if possible, uh, people who had lived there for a long time or were from there originally, because then they had all the cultural references that they could talk about when they um, were interrogating. So if they were talking to someone and they wanted to put the man at ease to get him to talk. They could talk, for instance, about the local soccer club, something like that. How were you chosen to be a Ritchie boy? It was it, it was taken from the card catalog. Um, the, uh, the, the Ritchie boys themselves had no say in it. They just got a, they got called in one day and were told that they were going on assignment to some place. They weren't even told where it was. And they uh, traveled then up to uh, up to Cascade, Maryland, where the camp was, and walked into this strange place where men were running around in German army uniforms. Why in German army uniforms? Um, well, the director of the camp was a very interesting man. His name was Charles Banfill. Um, he was a World War One vet. He was a flying ace. And he was not only the commander put in command of Camp Ritchie, but at the same time he served as assistant chief of military intelligence services in D.C. And so he had a direct line to the War Department. And so um, he almost got anything that he asked for. And his theory was that you could best prepare for 
war, the war situation in Europe by having it replicated in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains. And so that's what he did. He, um, he uh, had a core of people, um, a whole unit of people called it Composite School Unit, which was totaled about 450 men, and they were all dressed in German army uniforms. They um, would march around the camp singing Nazi songs. They had all the German vehicles there, the German weaponry. Uh, they had simulated battles th- that were done with these people. And um, one, of the, one of the men said that when he came to Ritchie, he learned some Nazi songs that he'd never heard at home. Um, and so this was the feeling that that they could best be prepared for what they were going to face by being immersed in that here in Maryland. And so um, he had Hitler rallies that were held every so often, and these mimicked the rallies that were held in the Sports Palast in Berlin. Um, and so there were actors there who took on the role of uh, Himmler and uh, Hitler and Göring and Rosenberg and held these fanatic speeches and uh, then they had whole reenacted battles and as a matter of fact Banfield himself in order to make this seem realistic would take to the air in his Piper Cub and he would fly over the camp dropping five pound bags of flour and uh, all the men then had to run for cover. And if any of them got flour on them, they had the equivalent of a demerit. He even had a, a cemetery constructed, a fake cemetery constructed in the camp with little verses on it. Like one said simply, Billy Mize, he didn't practice, here he lies. And so the men would have to walk by this, this graveyard every time they... Uh, <laughs> they went to class, so it was a, it was an amazing, amazing establishment that he set up there. How long were the classes for, and how many different classes did they have over the four years? Okay, they they uh, the basic the basic classes were eight weeks, and during the first five weeks, they all took the same thing, uh, and this would include things like terrain intelligence. Uh, photo analysis, map making, weather studies, Morse code, you name it. <clears throat> and then at the end of the five weeks, and it was Banfield himself who decided this, uh, what specialties the men would have. And then they were assigned to, in general, three specialties, the largest, of course, being interrogation of German prisoners of war. Uh, the next largest was photo analysis, um, where the uh, men had two photos lay out side by side, um, sort of like a stereoscope viewer, except they learned to do it with their eyes alone without needing the stereoscope. So they had three-dimensional images of a landscape, and then they were trained to study that to be able to find uh, camouflaged vehicles, tanks and things, and study troop movement and everything, and then put this on a map for the, uh, for the uh, army. Um, and then the third, the third category, and this was probably the most important, was order of battle. And these men uh, were trained to study and evaluate all sorts of documents, enemy documents. And this could be something from captured orders to pay books to newspapers to personal letters, uh, anything that would give them information about every single fighting unit in Europe, um, the German fighting unit in Europe. And um, this was then put together in a book that was regularly updated and sent to the to the armies in Europe, and the interrogators could use this. 
so so that when they were interrogating, before they even interrogated, they could look up and see how large the unit was uh, from which the man came, um, where they had fought before they came to the to the uh, uh, place where they were captured, um, uh, what the size, how many how many uh, how many uh, uh, tanks they had, what what the equipment was, what kind of guns they had. And so they could go into these interrogation sessions knowing quite a bit about the unit from which the prisoner came. And then they could ask the the prisoner something, and if the unit, the the prisoner would respond, well, I uh, don't have to tell you that. I only have to give name, rank, and serial number. Uh, Then the interrogator could say, well, it doesn't matter anyway. I I know that... uh, uh, so-and-so is your commander and that you fought uh, before this in such and such a place, and so that's okay. At which point, usually, the prisoner would relax, thinking, oh, my heavens, they know everything about us already. And so this was a big help for the interrogators. How many Germans, uh, and I know you have chapters on Japanese and some Italians, but how many Germans were uh, POWs were brought to Camp Ritchie? Uh, well, actually, no POW German POWs were brought to Camp Ritchie until after the war, and then <clears throat> I mean VE Day, not VJ, but VE Day, and uh, then a number of German generals were brought to the camp, and with prisoner of war support. Uh, and these um, generals then that were brought to the camp were writing up reports about the war, about different aspects of the fighting um, for use for America in a future Cold War, frankly. So, two, two quick questions. How often did somebody come from the German army to Camp Ritchie and vice versa, how often would somebody trained at Camp Ritchie go behind the lines into the German uh, troops over there? How often did either one of those happen? Well, um, as far as the uh, going abroad, um, yeah, quite a few of them went behind the lines and for different kinds of purposes. Um, some of them went behind the lines, for instance, into German-occupied France to help downed American airmen get out and get safely back to England. Um, Some of them went to work with the French resistance over there and to organize things. Um, They were frequently closely um, aligned with the Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, the uh, forerunner of the CIA, in carrying out some of these operations. And then sometimes they went behind German lines to uh, simply get information. Uh, they would put on German uniforms, German army uniforms, and go behind the lines and, and try to find things out. Now, this wasn't the vast minority, vast majority of Richie boys that did this, but there was a considerable number who did. What would you say, jumping to the end, i come back and go over a lot of other things, but jumping to the end, what did they accomplish and how important were they to what aspect of World War II for the United States and Europe, for that matter, for the British, for the French? Well, um, it was stated after the war that um, the intelligence that the Ritchie boys provided was absolutely crucial, um, that they had provided 60 percent of the intelligence that the Allies used during the war. Now. Uh, lots of people cite that and praise the Ritchie boys for it, but this was before um, everybody found out about the Enigma machine, Bletchley Park, and all that. Um, so the percentage is somewhat less. <laughs> we don't know what exactly the percentage would be, but um, <clears throat> it, they said over and over again that uh, they shortened the war considerably by doing what they did. 
And um, if you add Camp Sharp to it, the subcamp of Ritchie, where they trained in psych warfare, um, they not only interrogated prisoners, they were the ones that got the prisoners in many cases to surrender by going out in front of the front of the lines and speaking by microphone directly to the enemy troops and persuading them to surrender. And um, thousands surrendered this way um, to Richie Boys, then came over and were questioned by Richie Boys. What's the difference between your book on Camp Sharp's Psycho Boys and uh, the Richie Boys, uh, which came out, what, this one's this year, the one we're talking about was this year? And the yes. Psycho, yeah. Psycho Boys was it, 2019? Uh, no, it came out earlier than that. I think it was, I can't remember. I think it's three or four years ago anyway. Um, the difference is that um, <clears throat> there were many, many fewer people in the camp in Gettysburg. So where there were tens of thousands of people at Camp Ritchie, there were uh, about 800 who passed through Camp Sharp. Um because they were so focused on psychological warfare. And so as far as the two books goes, um, the Camp Sharp book is more personal stories following men through the training to Europe, through the zones, entering the camps, going back home. Um, the other thing, the uh, other difference between Camp Sharp and Camp Ritchie that I discovered when I was doing my Camp Ritchie work is that the uh, psych warfare boys, they, they did um, interrogation too, but they did it for a different purpose. Um, the uh, Ritchie boys were interrogating to try to get tactical information, and the um, Camp Sharp boys were interrogating in order to study morale, because if they understood the morale, they could better prepare the propaganda pamphlets that they wrote or the appeals that they made over the radio or at the front lines. Who owns uh, Camp Ritchie, Fort Ritchie today? Um, it's just recently been bought, and it's uh, fortunately uh, the the place had been very run down, but now it's being built up. The houses are being restored. Um, two buildings at the camp, two of the original stone buildings, are going to be made into uh, a museum, an archive, and uh, it's a, it's a very exciting thing. It's a local entrepreneur that's doing this, and. Uh, He's going to uh, he he has to maintain all the old stone buildings the way they were on the outside, um, but uh, the the old classrooms are going to become uh, boutiques or they're going to become uh, rentals vacation rentals, and so it's it's kind of an exciting time for Richie. I believe the museum is going to try to open already this fall. So what kind of thing would you put in the museum? Oh, well, it's going to be museum archives. And so lots and lots of, of papers, memoirs, memorabilia, um, equipment that they had, um, books books that they've written. And there's lots and lots of memoirs written by Richie Boys, but they were either published just for the family or put out by uh, vanity presses, and so it's very hard to get hold of them. So they will all be housed there, um, and then there will be programs that will be housed there too. They already have things like models of the camp, what it looked like at different stages of its history, and um, they have... Souvenirs that came from Camp Ridgey at the time that the Camp Ridgey boys had, uh, pillows and scarves and things like that. You say in your book that at the end of September, five rail cars filled with captured enemy documents were delivered to the camp to be integrated into the Ritchie libraries. Five rail cars? What, yes. What kind of material was it? Well, that was captured war material. Is it cataloged anywhere? Um, well, it all went back to D.C. eventually. Um, 
to the document center, Washington doc- document center. But uh, during Camp Ritchie heyday, um, they brought all this captured Japanese material to Ritchie, and they brought in Japanese language specialists to analyze it and go through it. And then after the war, as I said, they brought these 12 generals here, but they also sent over from Germany all the captured war documents that they had from there. And um, then uh, Wax and Richie Wax and Richie Boys went through all that material, cataloged it, put it in order, evaluated it, decided what was worthwhile keeping and what was not so worthwhile keeping. And um, this went on really until until the end of the war, until 1946. You tell a story in your book, uh, it starts on page 266, about a Captain Spurl and horses and a Luftwaffe colonel. Can you remember that one? Yeah. Um, he was, uh, yeah, he was negotiating with this man who said, who came to him, actually. and um, A German? Yes. The German and, Luftwaffe colonel came to Captain Spurl? He was he was a horse lover and he wanted to have the horses saved he because he knew that the uh Russians would probably use them for food probably kill them and these were Lipitzaner horses from Vienna and um I I haven't the story totally sharp in my head still after all this but um the the deal was made that yes they uh, they would rescue the horses, um, but the uh, Germans insisted that they had to be captured. They didn't want to surrender, and so Spurl arranged for a fake battle to be held with them so that they could be defeated, and then the horses were taken and and they surrendered. Go back uh, earlier, and I'll use the English pronunciation, uh, which is not the way you would call it, but Thomas Mann. Uh, son, uh, I guess son and daughter, Erica and Klaus Mann, as you would say. Um, yeah. what, what was your interest there in doing a, a book? Uh, my interest in them was uh, how did these Germans respond to America and how did America respond to these Germans? Um, they were a very, very famous man's children, and they played on that um, so that they got preferential treatment wherever they went. And when they uh, immigrated then to America, they went around giving speeches about what the true situation was in Germany and Americans should get involved. And... um, they became very popular as speakers, Erica particularly. Um, and then some Americans disliked them or turned on them um, because they didn't want to go to war. Of course, there was that whole movement, you know, to keep America out of the war. But um, they were they were pretty effective until after the war. And this is what interested me, how everything turned as soon as the war was over. Um, they uh, couldn't get speaking engagements anymore, even though Erica was traveling all around post-war Europe and gathering material and reports on it. Klaus couldn't get any more books published and had difficulty writing. And so this interested me, uh, more, almost more the American reaction to Klaus and Erica, as Klaus and Erica's reaction as Germans to the Americans. Is sort of an interesting back and forth between them, and that's, that's what I wanted to study. What led to Klaus Mann's uh, suicide? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, he'd been suicidal for quite a long time, but um, my theory is that he had no place, he had no home anymore. He, his last novel, which he never completed, um, he has a statement in it that I think speaks for himself when he said, um, 
I'm responsible for the death of five million people in the concentration camps. Of course, I was not there, but I am a German. And I am responsible for the deaths of thousands of people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and uh, because I'm an American citizen. And I think the instant jump into the Cold War, um, you know, the uh, the weapons are hardly cooled before America was in the... Uh, in the Cold War, and this was very disturbing to many, many German immigrants because they were interested in denazification of the Germans and re-education of the Germans, and um, the Americans were saying, look, if these former Nazis can help us in the Cold War effort, we're going to use them. And it was very, very distressing, I think, for many of them. And then a great many of them were um, considered communist because they were premature anti-fascists. Um, they had been against Germany too early, and so therefore they, they were communist, tainted. And uh, the uh, the hearings, the McCarthy hearings, were very bad for the Germans. A lot of the German immigrants, it's very interesting, they returned to Europe, not to Germany, but to Switzerland or Czechoslovakia or France or someplace else because because actually of this whole Red Scare movement in the States, as did Thomas Mann himself. Stefan Heim, um, I saw some video on YouTube of him in East Germany, talking about East Germany. Can you explain his involvement with the Ritchie boys and why he ended up back in East Germany? Well, he was a Ritchie boy, and he was communist uh, inclined, um, very idealistic. He, he came over to the States. He, uh, he, he fled um, because he was a Jew. So he came over to the States. He married an American woman. Um, he uh, wrote a novel called The Hostages about the situation in Czechoslovakia that became a Hollywood film. So he was doing very, very well in America. Uh, he went through training at Camp Ritchie and then went to Camp Sharp for more training in psychological warfare. Um, it was sent to Germany then, and he did newspaper work and radio work. Um, when the war was over then, he was working on the uh, newspaper, uh, Die Neue Zeitung. It was a newspaper put out in the American zone, and he was writing for that. And um, then he was called back to the States, because it was felt that he uh, was too sympathetic to the uh, to the Russian allies, former Russian allies. So he came back to the States. And then this whole anti-communist thing really bothered him. And so he returned all his medals and uh, to the uh, to the government and uh, went to Germany and settled in East Germany, uh, but it is a privileged uh, position. He could he could travel. He could leave there. His American wife went with him. Um, living in East Germany, he c continued to write novels, but he wrote them in English first and then translated them into Germany. Um, he, the, war, the wall fell, of course, in Germany, and... He was actually elected to the uh, German parliament, the United German Parliament. Um, again, he got upset because the uh, parliament members of parliament voted themselves a hefty pay raise, and so he quit that. <laughs> but he uh, he died soon after that too. Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon's father, Peter Wyden, was a Ritchie boy, and the last book that he wrote before he died a number of years ago, was on the Berlin Wall. What can you tell us about him? Yes, his name was actually Peter Weidenreich um, when he <laughs> emigrated from Germany. Um, and Colonel Banfield um, encouraged 
all the German and Austrian immigrants that had German names or especially Jewish sounding uh, German names to change their names. And the idea was that if you got captured over there, uh, you could probably be executed then as a traitor to your country um, if if uh, you had that German name there. And so a lot of them changed their names, and he changed his then to Wyden. Um, he uh, was uh, another one who was both a Ritchie boy and a, and a Camp Sharp boy. Um, and he got very involved with with newspaper work. Um, there were little mini newspapers that were there called the Front Post, uh, uh, Mail of the Front. They would shoot these into enemy lines, giving the true news of what was going on in the war. So he did that. And then when uh, the Allies entered Germany and as they took over towns, um, uh, GIs would be assigned to the uh, newspaper and to get local newspapers going, again, giving the, the true news. And um, so Peter Wyden was very active in that. And then he, too, went to Berlin and was involved in the newspaper, the, the Allied news, the American Allied newspaper that was put out there, Die Neue Zeitung. Um, and he wrote what I consider his most interesting work. It's called Stella. It's He found out that one of his Jewish classmates when he was a child in school uh, was a beautiful, blonde, <laughs> Aryan-looking <laughs> girl, and he'd had a crush on her. And he found out that she had betrayed Jews and reported uh, reported countless Jews to the Nazis and to the concentration camps, and so he wrote a book trying to understand how that happened. I think this is an absolutely fascinating study, and I'm not going to tell how it happened because <laughs> I th think people ought to read that book. It's beautifully written. Is it Stella in English? Yes. Yes. Um. You have a, page 258, you have a back-and-forth coded letter exchange between an Austrian-born Leo Handel and a Danish-born uh, gentleman by Melchior. Um, I can read it, but uh, before I read some of it, uh, what was this all about? Why did they have letters that they wrote in code? Well, uh, of course, there was very strict censorship, and uh, you didn't want any news getting out about um, uh, what the state of the war was, how things were going, or even where they were. And uh, these were two very, very good friends, and um, one of them, the Leo Handel, was sent to Italy to interrogate prisoners of war, and uh, Ib Melchior was sent to Germany as a counterintelligence agent. So they were doing very different things, very different functions. Um, all this was hush-hush, secret-secret what they were doing. And so they had to evade the censors in some way. And, uh, let, uh, me, let me just read a little bit so people know what we're yes. talking about. Uh, you write, it was based on the beginning and end of a letter, how we greeted each other and how we signed off. Uh, dear Leo meant I'm in Germany. Hi, Leo meant I'm in Italy. Hi, buddy meant I'm in Africa. Hi, good buddy meant I'm stuck in England. And in signing off, your buddy meant I'm in, in uh, CIC working in a rear echelon headquarters, while your good buddy meant I work as a CIC agent with the frontline troops. Best regards meant I'm in IPW, with the frontline troops, I can go on and on, but uh, that, um, how did you find that one, by the way? Um, Ib Melchior wrote the book. He wrote a book about his time as a, as a, uh, a CIC agent and all the things that he did. Um, fascinating book. And uh, he also thought that uh, Leo Handel was just a terrific guy. And, um, 
he the both of them went to both of them were interested in filmmaking um both of them went to hollywood after after the war and became film producers and um Ib Melchior actually wrote a film script. The, the film was never produced, but he wrote a script about um, Leo Handel in Italy and one uh, one heroic action that he did for which he he uh, got a bronze star. And um, it, it, it's an interesting friendship um, between Austrian and a Dane, uh, a Lutheran Dane, and and a uh, Jewish Austrian, and uh, w- what they did together, and uh, th- they were lifelong friends. Um, they were best men at each other's weddings, and um, when Handel was trying to put him out a movie and and didn't have enough money, Melchior stepped in to help him. Very interesting people. On uh, your personal background, did you really translate a 15th century text of Dracula? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where, what was the translation from from what language to what language? It was it was an old German. <laughs> and what happened to the translation? Oh, it was it was published. A, a museum had the the uh, text, and so. Um, I translated it for the museum because they wanted to put it out, I guess, for Halloween. I don't know. Um, and uh, so I, I just got interested. It's something I dashed off. Now, you and your husband wrote a weekly column for the Gettysburg Times on the social history of words. Yes. What was that like? How's, how'd you like working with your husband every week on something like this? Oh, it was the it was the most fun because we were both teachers, and uh, he taught in Harrisburg, and I taught in Carlisle, and we had a long commute every day. And so on these commute, it it just started with, gee, I wonder how this word came about, or I wonder why they call such and such such and such, and uh, then we we thought it would be fun to try doing a column, and so we. Uh, approached the Gettysburg Times, and the uh, editor there was very interested. And so for for nine years, we uh, did this together, and it, it worked out very well working with him because, uh, he first of all, he's an English teacher and English composition instructor, instructor, and so he could help me. And so what we did is that we took turns writing. So I wrote every other week. And then he wrote the weeks in between. And then the one who didn't write critiqued the article that the other one had written. And uh, it was it was fun. I, I learned a lot about writing, actually, and doing that. Did you ever put it in a book? No, I thought about it once, but I never followed through on it. Back to the Ritchie, Camp Ritchie, and a um, couple things, but and Camp Sharp. Um can people go visit either place today? Ah, very good point. And here I want to put in a plug for Camp Sharp. The Camp Sharp site is now a youth campsite. Um, and if you go to it, it's on the, actually on the battlefield. Um, and youth rent spaces there and stay there for a week while they study the Battle of Gettysburg. But the youth that stay there have absolutely no idea what the place is or what it was. And um, the barracks are all gone, uh, but there's rows of evergreens outlining where the barracks were. And um, ironically, where the motor pool was at Camp Sharp is now the horse trailer parking lot. Um, where the commandant's office was is now the trailer for where the youth leader camps. And the, uh, the uh, latrines are now porta potties. So, so the whole layout of the camp is no one knows it. And what I'd love to see happen in my lifetime is to get a marker put up there telling about what Camp Sharp was and what happened there. As a matter of fact, I'm collecting signatures for that right now to 
to uh, approach the National Park Service of Gettysburg to try to try to get a sign put up. What about Camp Ritchie? Hey, can you stay anywhere around there now and see it? Uh you, you can see it, yes. Uh, as I say, it's it's all being fixed up now. It's kind of an interesting time to go. And um, there's a, one modern building there now, uh, which is a, a center, a community center, uh, a tri-county community center. And uh, there they have a little... Um, a little temporary museum that you can see of of the Ritchie boys. And then they have a whole corridor where they have uh, the whole history of the camp and what went on there. And uh, it's it's worth visiting. Out of the 15,000-plus people that were at Fort uh, Camp Ritchie, did any of them, once they were trained, once they were put into the military units, the United States military units, did any of them turn on the United States and go back to their home countries? Well, there were a couple of, of spies, actually. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of one. His name was Kurt Ponger. Uh, he was an Austrian, and he was an Austrian communist. And he, uh, throughout the war, worked very well as a Ritchie boy. Um, and then he was stationed in Austria, in the post-war uh, occupation of Austria. And he then was found out that he was spying for Russia. And uh, he was actually sent to prison for 20 years. I named a lot of people in the beginning of our discussion that famous names that people would know in politics. Um, John Kluge at Metro Media, William Sloan Coffin, J.D. Solinger, David Rockefeller, John Chafee, Frank Church, who ran on, eventually did that deep study of uh, the CIA, and Vernon Walters. Do you know anything on the background of what they did after being Camp Ritchie boys in the war? In the war. It's very hard to find that out. Um, the the material that are, is available in the archives um, doesn't doesn't go into detail. Um, and I, of course, was just interested. I was focused on Richie, but um, through all these memoirs, of course, you can you can find out what they did. And a lot of them, you know, David Rockefeller and uh, Vernon Walter, and they've written their memoirs. You can you can read about it there. On the makeup of Camp Ritchie, I've got several different lists of numbers that describe what they were that uh, – just check these numbers. I think I got them from a talk uh, – who was a gentleman that was giving you a lot of credit for this, Bernie Lubron, who is the son of a Ritchie boy. Right. <clears throat> he said the demographics that 54 percent of them were United States uh, citizens – I mean, originally um, – and a 15% German, 4% Austrian, 2% Italian, 7, uh, 2% Russian, and the rest of the country is 23%. Can you explain that, what that means? Um, yeah, they, they were trying to get multilinguists, and they were trying to get them for specific aspects of the campaign. And so a lot of people would be rushed in, for instance, they... Uh, they they called up Turkish speaking people and Turks uh, to come to Camp Ritchie to train for the invasion of Greece, and then that um, was decided uh, not the best thing to do, and so the Turks stayed on and and worked at Ritchie. Um, there were two hundred Native Americans that were. Um, in the African campaign, and they were sent back to Ritchie to serve as the reenactors that dressed up in uniform and staged battle scenes and so on. What about women? Ritchie. Um, and I, I think one of the more interesting things to me is uh, not the low percentages of those that came from Jamaica or from from Lebanon or whatever, um, is the uh, minority groups that were Americans. For instance, there were um, 32 black Ritchie boys, 
and in a Jim Crow army. That's pretty extraordinary. These were uh, men who were trained in intelligence and intelligence actions, and uh, some of them did very, very well, but then the army didn't really know what to do with them. For instance, the very first class at Ritchie, uh, Leroy Woodson was a black. He had pulled himself up by his bootstraps. He uh, was working on his dissertation in D.C., and he applied to go to the first class of Ritchie. Uh, There were 500 applications, and only 32 men were accepted, and he was one of them, and he was the only black in the unit. He was a lieutenant. Um, and after he was through serving at, at Ritchie, he, he kept on there for a while um, as an instructor and uh, as an organizer for the reenactments that were done. And then he was sent into, eventually to Fort Huachuca for GI training to train guys in, in intelligence. Um, and he got increasingly frustrated because he he even came back to Ritchie and took another course in uh, photo interpretation. So he he had interrogation, he had photo interpretation, he had done all this work teaching actually at Ritchie. He'd gotten superior grades, and he could not get promoted. And he couldn't get promoted because the army had a regulation that a uh, White white service men could not serve under black officers, and uh, he was terribly frustrated. And finally, he did get over with an all black unit uh, to Italy, but uh, this was pretty consistent. There was a there was another black, Daniel Skinner. He uh, he was a Phi Beta Kappa from from uh, from Harvard in languages and um, again they didn't know what to do with him and so they bounced him around from hither to yon he too was the lieutenant and couldn't get any higher couldn't get any more responsible job and so he got sent over there finally as a translator and a jeep driver so that, I think, is an untold story that is very, very interesting. Another one is the uh, Nisei, the Japanese Americans. A lot of those that came to Ritchie were recruited directly from the American internment camps. And you you, you think about how, how the Germans had it versus how the, the uh, Japanese Americans had it. Um, the army is really inconsistent. Um, the Nisei, after all, these are American citizens. And 80,000 of them were interned with their parents. Um, they couldn't fight in Asia. They couldn't become commissioned officers. And their service opportunities were extremely limited. Whereas German nationals who weren't American citizens... Only 10,000 of them were interned. Rushed citizenship was offered to them. Um, They could fight in Europe, and they could become commissioned officers. So um, uh, you you see here, too, discrimination on the hands of the army versus its own American citizens, I think especially in regard to the blacks and the Nisei. We are out of time. Professor Beverly Driver, Eddie, the name of the book is Richie Boy Secrets, How a Force of Immigrants and Refugees Helped Win World War II. And we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.